In July of 2017, something huge was announced. Tomorrow Studios and Sueisha would be working together to bring my favorite anime and manga, One Piece, to live action. I, like most people, was a bit skeptical when I first heard about this because live action adaptations of anime don't have a very good track record. I usually try to avoid them like the plague, but I have seen Full Metal Alchemist, Bleach, and I know this doesn't necessarily count as an anime, but The Last Airbender, and let me tell you, they were all terrible. Of those three, I definitely enjoyed Bleach the most, but even that movie was missing the charm the anime had. The characters were kind of cringy, the CGI was very jarring, and the plot was rushed. But I never lost hope that maybe one day, a genuinely good live action adaptation of an anime would get made, so I decided to push my skepticism aside and be optimistic. Then six years later, the perfect live action adaptation dropped on Netflix for all to stream. Before you get it twisted, I am not saying this show has no flaws. I'm only saying it was a perfect adaptation. The East Blue Saga was far from perfect in the anime, but it served as an excellent way to get the story of One Piece rolling. Unlike manga to anime adaptations, a live action adaptation cannot be a one for one shot remake of the entire series because the mediums are way too different. The most successful comic book to live action adaptation to date is the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The writers for the MCU use heroes, villains, and stories lines from the comics as a template as they flesh it out for a feature length film. If you haven't read the comics, I'm sure you've all heard over a million times by now that in the comics, Thanos erased half of all life in the universe because he was in love with death, as opposed to the movies where he did it as a twisted way to save the universe from overpopulation. This was a change that needed to happen, because while this may have worked really well in the comics, a villain who kills someone just because they were simping for a woman who hadn't even been introduced in the MCU wouldn't have come off as threatening, and the final boss for the Infinity Saga needed to be seen as the biggest threat. But I'm getting off topic. My main point is, changing things from the anime doesn't mean this isn't a perfect adaptation. As a matter of fact, changing things from the anime is what made it a perfect adaptation. Despite some of its shortcomings, the show did something I will be eternally grateful for. It made me feel something most One Piece fans have been craving for a long time. The feeling of watching One Piece all over again for the first time. I rewatched the anime and reread the manga multiple times. Yes, I know that's a lot to rewatch and reread, and I know it probably makes me a bit of a crazy person, but throughout all of those reviewings, I never got the same mystical feeling I got when I watched it for the first time back in 2015, and I never thought I would. I never expected this project to give me that feeling, but it did. That's how I know for sure that this show has perfectly captured the essence of One Piece. In this video, I plan to go over Netflix's One Piece live action's greatest strengths and weaknesses. Some of its shortcomings were very intertwined with its high points, so we'll be essentially going back and forth between the good and the bad. Since I've been a fan of One Piece for nearly 8 years, I obviously have a lot of attachment to the original series, and therefore, some of the things I perceive as flaws, others may perceive as okay or even a strength of the series. Either way, these are all opinions and we're all just having fun over here. With that being said, let's get right into the first major strength. One of the most important things for any show to have in order for it to succeed is an interesting protagonist. If the lead character isn't captivating enough, the audience won't want to follow their journey and watch the next episode. Luffy in the anime was obviously an interesting character as all One Piece fans have been following his journey for over a thousand episodes, and I questioned whether this adaptation of Luffy would have the same charm he did in the anime. Fortunately, they found the person who was perfectly able to capture the essence of what made Monkey D. Luffy so special in the anime, Inaki Gudo. Boy. Luffy is a very cartoonish character, and that's something I can say now with zero controversy because of some recent developments in the anime. He's very simple-minded, he rarely thinks about the consequences of his own actions, and he can come off as a bit selfish at times. A lot of these things about his personality was changed in the live action because it's difficult to watch and follow a real person act in somewhat inhumane ways. For example, in the anime, Luffy hits Kobe just because. <laughs> Well, in the live action, he made it clear that he slapped Kobe because he was talking down on himself and his own dream. It's not like he was completely evil in the anime, but he was a bit more callous as to why he hit him, and that wouldn't have worked as well in the live action. 
Another change I noticed was Luffy actually listened to Nojiko talk about Nami's backstory, while in the anime, Luffy couldn't care less about her past. I always thought the anime version of Luffy came off as cold in that aspect, because it seemed like he wasn't even attempting to understand why Nami was doing the things she was doing. However, him taking interest in her situation in this show actually made it seem like he was interested in Nami's well-being. Now I know Oda had his reasons for making Luffy uninterested in Nami's backstory as it had them pay off later in the arc, but it's just one of those things that probably wouldn't have worked as well in this live action medium. The most gasp worthy change to Luffy's character was at the end of the Orange Town episode when Luffy turned down the mayor's food out of consideration for the village because they were obviously struggling. He of course double backed and took a little bit for a snack, but this was definitely a huge change because Luffy had explicitly talked about this in the anime. <laughs> Again, I'm not saying Luffy in the anime was a heartless person, but he would definitely take full advantage of someone's generosity when they offer him food, and he wouldn't think twice about whether they needed it or not. The change they made for this show was necessary because it humanized Luffy. Anime Luffy didn't need to be humanized because he's not human, he's a cartoon, but this Luffy doesn't have the benefit of being a cartoon, so making him feel like a human who we can love and follow for a few episodes was essential. And even though these small changes were made, the core of Luffy's personality was the same. In both the anime and the live action, Luffy was a carefree adventurer. All he really cared about was being able to do what he wanted and pursuing his dream. This aspect of his personality was the most important one to nail, because without it, Luffy had no reason to believe the One Piece existed, much less chase after it. He wouldn't be as expiring of a character if he didn't adamantly pursue his dreams no matter the cost. He wouldn't be anywhere near as funny. Without his innocent, fun, adventurous spirit, he would just be some random dude not Monkey D. Luffy. And Naki Godoy was able to capture this one aspect of Luffy really well, and that was the biggest factor as to the success of this show. Like I was saying earlier, Naki Godoy's portrayal of Monkey D. Luffy was phenomenal, and it was one of the best parts of the show. However, there were small changes here and there that were a bit undesirable. I know I was just talking about how a lot of these minor changes were necessary and it helped humanize him in the live action medium, but there was one thing in particular that was a little off-putting. Luffy's intelligence, or more specifically, his awareness, was definitely increased in this adaptation. He still did things that were dumb, but there were multiple moments where he said or did things that I couldn't believe he would actually say nor do. The worst example of Luffy's heightened awareness was every time he said, I'm a different kind of pirate. The anime wasn't as black and white with the morality of Luffy and other pirates like the live action was. They made it clear they were going to be a bit more black and white with the conversation between Luffy and Kobe in the first episode about how they were good pirates and bad pirates just like they were good marines and bad marines. The anime made it clear that even these so-called good marines weren't morally perfect as they work for an organization which required them to allow truly horrifying atrocities to happen, like slavery and genocide. They did attempt to touch on this topic a little bit with the conversation between Kobe and Garp, but it was overshadowed by the unambiguous black and white morality presented in this whole show. To Luffy, being a pirate was about being free, so he didn't associate things like plundering and murdering with piracy. Unlike a regular sailor, a pirate doesn't have to respect the authority of the world government, nor the marines, because they had no affiliation to anyone. In the anime, it was almost like Luffy wasn't even aware most people associated pirates with murdering and plundering, but that obviously wasn't the case in the live action. Every time he said he's a different type of pirate, he not only showcased his awareness of what pirates were commonly known for, but he also seemed to be morally distancing himself from these other pirates. In the anime, Luffy never verbally distanced himself like he did in this adaptation. Instead, he demonstrated through his actions that he was a different kind of pirate. One example I vividly remember was during the Orange Town arc when the dog, I think his name is pronounced Shushu, got his shop completely destroyed. Nami got mad at Luffy because he was a pirate and claimed that she would kill him here to stop him from gathering a crew and hurting people in the future. Luffy didn't try to calm Nami down and explain he was a different kind of pirate. Instead, he just callously shrugged her off and said, as if you could ever kill me. 
Then he walked towards the dog and gave him the only box of dog treats he can salvage from the shop. This act not only demonstrated that he cared about what happened to other people and animals, but it also conveyed that he mostly fought the lion for the dog's honor. He was not the type of person to sit by and watch as someone fought so hard to protect what was precious to them. I loved scenes like this because it was where we got to subtly learn more about what it meant to Luffy to be a pirate. But in the live action, with Luffy constantly attempting to distance himself from other pirates, it somewhat made him come off as a pick-me pirate. There were a couple of instances where Luffy verbally told people he was a different kind of pirate that wasn't too bad. After Luffy made the scuffed Jolly Roger and declared that they were the Straw Hat crew, Zoro said their name had to be scary. Luffy replied with, Who says pirates have to be scary? This interaction was amazing because Luffy was just going by his own definition of what it meant to be a pirate, and it implied some ignorance as to what most people thought pirates were. It's so different from the other situations because he wasn't throwing other pirates under the bus, nor did it seem like he was taking the moral high ground. This was arguably a really small nitpick, but it had to be mentioned because nailing the protagonist was essential for this show to be good. For the most part, they nailed Luffy almost perfectly. It was just this small thing that really stood out and bothered me. Rono Azoro was one of my favorite Straw Hats, so I am happy to report that this live action adaptation did his character justice. While some of the character's goofiness was removed, this adaptation did a really good job at capturing the essence of Zoro. His introduction in the live action was very different from the anime, but it was still amazing. His fight against Mr. Seven was only briefly referenced in the anime, and Oda drew a quick sketch of his character design in an SPS. To see the live action take these small moments and actually flesh them out was really special, and it helped make Zoro seem like a strong fighter. Not only were they planting seeds for future arcs, the production staff behind the One Piece live action were very aware of community memes, and they probably intentionally made Zoro's first action killing a black man in order to further the minority hunter memes. Zoro's hesitancy to joining Luffy's crew was set up perfectly. He had been scouted by Baroque works in the Marines in the past, so to him, Luffy's proposition was just another scouting attempt. He had no reason to join Luffy yet, so he decided to decline his offer. However, since Luffy did save his life, he felt some obligation to help him out, so he stuck around. It was a cool concept to have Zoro gain more respect for Luffy over time until he decided to become a loyal member of his crew, and it was executed almost perfectly. My only gripe with this development was that it wasn't 100% clear when Zoro decided to devote himself to the Straw Hat Pirates. After the first episode when Zoro helped Luffy fight back against Captain Axan Morgan, his debt was basically repaid since they both helped each other out once. Them traveling together made sense as they were allies and they needed to get away from the marines. However, Zoro risked his life to save Luffy from Buggy, even though he didn't owe him anything at that point. He could have easily left him to pursue his own dream, but he went back to save Luffy anyway. This represented Zoro already had a strong sense of loyalty to Luffy despite not considering himself part of his crew. Later before the Straw Hats arrived at Baratier, Nami told Zoro that he was Luffy's first mate, which implied that he was part of the crew despite not ever officially joining. Zoro being hesitant to join the crew was an interesting concept overall, but the execution of it was a little off. It would have been awesome if the first time he acknowledged Luffy as his captain was after the Mihawk fight. He could have come to the realization that traveling with Luffy already brought him so much closer to his dream as opposed to wandering aimlessly as a bounty hunter. Luffy's quest to become Pirate King would inevitably lead him to needing a powerful swordsman maybe even the best. So it was a great opportunity for Zoro, and this could have been the moment he realized it. I could tell this is what they were somewhat going for in the live action, but the ambiguous nature of Zoro's crew status and his unnatural loyalty to Luffy prior to the Mihawk fight didn't allow that moment to hit as hard as it should have. But like I said, overall, it was an interesting move to have Zoro wait before joining the crew because it only added to his character development and it made him feel like an actual loyal member of the Straw Hats. Captain Axehan Morgan was the second antagonist Luffy had to take down and his live action counterpart was noticeably different from the anime. Because in the anime, Captain Morgan was an evil tyrant. His greed led him to heavily tax the citizens of Shellstown and everyone was scared at the mere mention of his name. He ordered his soldiers to execute a little girl and when one marine hesitated due to the absurdity of those instructions, Morgans killed him or at least attempted to kill him. When Zoro and Luffy used their monster strength to best the marines, 
they realized they couldn't stop this unbeatable duo. Captain Morgan then told everyone who displayed weakness to shoot themselves in the head. He was the definition of corruption in the anime, but the live action removed a lot of his straight up evilness. In the live action, Captain Morgan's corruption was much more subtle as he was mostly a normal marine captain. He had slight character flaws as he was prideful, arrogant, and dealt out super harsh punishments on criminals. In the anime, Morgan's son Helmeppo abused his father's influence by taking advantage of the citizens of Shellstown, but it was unclear if he was doing the same in the live action. When Rika bumped into Helmeppo and dropped her rice cakes, it was clearly her fault for not looking where she was going. He was a bit of a dick about it, especially when he stepped on it, but he wasn't bullying her as hard as he was in the anime. In the anime, he went out of his way to ruin those rice cakes. And bully not only that little girl, but everyone in town. It didn't look like Helmeppo was going to escalate the incident, but then Zoro stepped in. In order to defend Rika's honor, he was going to force Helmeppo to eat off the floor. So when you think about it, Zoro was the one who started the fight in the bar, and it made a lot of sense that Captain Morgan punished him for it. Zoro's punishment was harsh, but in Morgan's defense, he did offer him a way out by joining the marines. So at this point, he just seems like a good captain trying to keep the peace and grow the strength of the marines. He did hit Helmeppo, but Helmeppo's dickish actions were part of the reason why the whole conflict happened in the first place. It was wrong to hit him, but it just made it seem like Captain Morgan had a strong loyalty to the marines, and he was punishing Helmeppo for being disruptive to their mission, he didn't come off as selfish as his anime counterpart. We don't know if Morgan was going to keep up his end of the deal to free Zoro after the 7 day punishment, we can only go by Helmeppo's words when he claimed his father would never let him go. But in the anime, we can go by both Helmeppo's words and by Morgan's actions since he was such a monster. I didn't completely hate this change to Morgan's character because it was an understandable one. For a live action medium, seeing characters act so cartoonishly evil would be too jarring. It wouldn't allow the audience to take his character seriously at all. One example of this that has been vividly burned into my mind was the director of S.W.O.R.D. Hayward from the Marvel TV show WandaVision. When I was watching this show, I was consistently confused by this character's actions because it seemed like he did evil without much justification. He lied to all of the sword agents by claiming Wanda stole Vision's corpse from their base and reanimated it by showing them a clip of her breaking down doors and smashing through glass to get his body back when he was actually there and he saw her leave without taking the body. Maybe he did this to make her seem like more of a threat, but it wasn't really necessary since she was already a huge threat for holding an entire town hostage. He also seemed uninterested in the truth and was just hell bent on killing Wanda instead of exploring safer options for everyone. At the end, he even attempted to shoot her children, and I still don't know why he decided to do that. He became cartoonishly evil, and when he did, his character wasn't interesting, nor did he seem like much of a threat. That's what the One Piece live action was trying to avoid, but in doing so, they left a lot of holes in contradictions in the story. The biggest one being Garp crucifying Captain Morgan and taking authority over his marines because it came out of nowhere. Morgans didn't do anything wrong other than fail at stopping Luffy, Nami, and Zoro from stealing the Grand Line map. To be treated as a criminal for something like that was crazy and it immediately made me question Garp's sense of justice because now he came off as unnecessarily strict and vicious. I heard a couple other people complain about this issue and I heard of one genius solution to patch it but I will be going into that in more depth in a different section since it has more relevance there. Overall, the great Captain Axiom Morgan didn't land too well with me. Changing the character was fine, but the creators of the show needed to consider the implications of those changes a bit more. As soon as I saw the casting for Buggy the Clown, I knew his character would be handled beautifully. If you don't know, I'm a huge Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. fan, and Jeff Ward played Deke Shaw, a character introduced in Season 5. He was such an interesting character because he was hard to trust due to his selfishness, but due to his circumstances, it felt like he was also a genuinely good person. Jeff Ward's acting in the show was so good that they had to come up with a semi-BS way to bring him back to life and join the main cast. So knowing how amazing of an actor he was, it didn't surprise me to see him absolutely kill it at this role. This version of Buggy somewhat put out Joker vibes since they were both chaotic murderous clowns, but Buggy also felt unique in his version of the psychotic clown. This was probably because he was a pirate with a bit more of a structured crew and he also didn't seem as insane as the Joker if that makes sense. Sometimes it felt like the Joker wanted to die, but Buggy definitely wasn't 
that crazy. Anyways, I'm getting sidetracked. Another thing I noticed was we didn't get the flashback of Buggy and Shanks being on the same crew and of how Shanks ruined his life. I'm not saying this was a good nor bad change, but it was definitely an interesting one. While we do miss out on a tiny bit of character development, it probably would have been too distracting from the spooky circus atmosphere they were trying to create if they included a flashback to Buggy and Shanks shared past. With the atmosphere that was created, it felt like we were in Buggy's domain and he had full control of everything. Even when Nami, Zoro, and Luffy finally got free, it still felt like a hopeless situation. Also, not having this backstory here made Shanks seem that much more mysterious because he began asking questions like, what did Shanks do to make Buggy this mad? And what type of person would ever consider Buggy to be an ally? In the anime with the flashback, we didn't have these types of questions because we saw Shanks being his good natured self. We also saw that the event Buggy described as Shanks ruining his life was actually 100% the fault of Buggy, but because he couldn't hold himself accountable for his own actions, he just blamed Shanks. The Chop Chop Fruit was handled very well. The CGI wasn't too jarring and it actually felt like he was dicing himself up at will. Not to mention, it seemed like Buggy was much more competent with his powers in the live action. In the anime, they made it clear that although he was immune to slashing attacks, Buggy's main weakness was getting hit with blunt force attacks like punches and kicks. So Luffy punching Buggy in the head should have technically done major damage, but it did next to none since Buggy consciously detached his head from his body before he was hit to soften the blow. Using his devil fruit this efficiently kind of reminded me how Katakuri used his devil fruit way down the line. Buggy obviously can't see into the future, but he was a seasoned enough fighter to predict and defend against these type of attacks. Having Buggy use his devil fruit like this partially removed an obvious weakness and therefore made him much more of a threat to conquer. Overall, Buggy was an amazing villain and I was satisfied to see him get pulled off so well. My least favorite arc of the East Blue Saga in the anime was Syrup Village, so I wasn't expecting much from the live action adaptation of it. I didn't hate it in the anime, but I was never a fan of Captain Kuro, because he was supposedly this incredibly smart person who planned an elaborate conspiracy, but somehow simultaneously extremely stupid. In the anime, he killed Mary when he gave him his birthday present from Miss Kaya early, which made no sense. He had been putting up with these people he had secretly hated for three years, and if he wanted to see him dead, he could have waited until the next day for the invasion. If you haven't watched the anime, then you're probably confused by that statement. In the anime, he wasn't just going to kill Kaya, he was going to use his black cat pirates, who were still loyal to him, to raid the village and make it seem as if Kaya's death in the raid was done by savage pirates. Mary probably would have been killed in that raid too, but for some reason, he just couldn't wait a little bit longer. Since Mary survived this attack, he was able to alert Kaya and make Kaya aware of Kuro's plan. There were other dumb things he did in the anime, but if I were to talk about all of them, we would be here all day. I hoped the live action Kuro would actually be smarter and not have this flaw of being this genius while acting like an impulsive child, but unfortunately Kuro was just as dumb in this live action if not dumber. When he killed Mary, he didn't even attempt to hide the body, he just left him lying around for anyone to find. Then when Zora was knocked out, he didn't even think to finish the job by using one of those many blades on his hand to stab him or maybe just slice his throat. Instead, he just had him thrown in a well, alive with all of his swords, and I guess just assume he would be dead? Also, when you look at his plan, it didn't quite make sense. He was going to have Kaya die right when she obtained the right to run the shipyard, and he had a sketchy contract that left control of Kaya's shipyard to him. He might have been able to get away with one of those things, but both somewhat point to the fact that he's responsible for Kaya's death, because not only did she die at the most convenient time, she also had a contract that even Mary thought was strange as it was completely in his benefit. It was hard to say Kuro was a disappointment in the live action because my expectations for him were already low, but I was still hoping for more. And I haven't even talked about how we actually had the opportunity to kill Kaya, but then decided to just talk to her for some reason. He was a mess and the arc suffered for it just like the anime. But the worst thing about this arc was how my boy Usopp got butchered. This was supposed to be Usopp's introduction to the series, but we barely learned anything about him. The Usopp pirates were removed, which if you don't know, Usopp had three kids who admired him enough they pretended to be pirates with him being the leader. I can understand why these children were excluded, but removing them also removed Usopp from the mentor role. These kids were how we were introduced to the idea that Usopp's lies could be seen as admirable. They demonstrated Usopp actually cared about people and they shared a special bond because these kids were among 
among the few who could understand Usopp past the lies. Removing this removed a lot of his character, and it wasn't really replaced with anything else. In the live action, we also didn't see how the villagers secretly enjoyed Usopp's annoying cries for pirates every day, because it brought some excitement into their lives. Usopp knew he was making things more interesting for the village by causing a ruckus daily, so he never stopped. And when Usopp finally left with the straw hats, the former Usopp pirates continued this tradition for him. Since this was non-existent in the live action, Usopp came off as a bit of a jerk. He tormented people of Serb Village daily because he desired to see his father. It was tragic, but it was also an incredibly selfish thing to do. Usopp's cowardice was barely shown in these couple of episodes as well. It was important to see how much of a coward he was because that made his actions of bravery stand out that much more. Losing the cowardice made moments like Usopp vowing to stay by Kaya and even standing up to Kuro not have as much value as it should have. And since Kuro's plan didn't involve pirates attacking the village, Usopp didn't have his moment where he decided to protect everyone by himself. He wasn't going to let pirates set foot in the village and just pretend that his warning to the villagers was just another one of his lies. It was the moment where Luffy, Zoro, and Nami decided to help Usopp out not because they pitied him, but because they found him to be honorable. He could have abandoned the village and saved himself, but he wanted to protect everyone, and he didn't care about receiving credit nor praise for the good deed. It was not an action-heavy moment, but it was a moment that was burned into my mind as it gave a true insight to the character of Usopp. Although he may be a coward, a liar, and an all-around jokester, he would do anything to protect what was precious to him. This was what was missing from the live action adaptation. At the end of the live action, I questioned why Usopp was even joining the crew. He didn't want to leave Syrup Village, but Luffy pushed him to come aboard and become a Straw Hat pirate. In the anime, Usopp wanted to fulfill his dream of becoming a brave warrior of the sea, and he was actually planning on setting sail on his own. That's when Luffy pushed Usopp to come with him, because he could accomplish his dream while traveling with his friends. Instead of developing Usopp, a lot of time was spent fleshing Zoro's character by telling his backstory. In the manga, his backstory was shown during the first arc, and in the anime, it was shown after Serb Village, but before Baratie, I believe. Anyways, I understood the choice to put his backstory here since they were awkwardly placed in both the anime and manga. Having the scenes flash back and forward from his past to him presently trying to climb out of a well was a bit underwhelming. Despite my criticisms of how the live action handled this part of One Piece, it wasn't all bad. Kaya's mansion had what I can only describe as haunted mansion vibes. Everything looked so fancy and well taken care of, yet so empty. A lot of effort obviously went into the set for this mansion, and I didn't mind we spent so much time here. The atmosphere felt so foreign as everything screamed fancy, wealthy, and structured, while the straw hats had been unsophisticated, so poor they were considering stealing a ship, and very spontaneous. Kaya and her mansion was everything the straw hats were not and so once again, it felt as if they were stepping into someone else's domain, where they had little to no control. Not to mention the whole mansion always felt dark, which made everything feel much more ominous. It felt like there was no escape from the mansion once they entered, especially once the metal gate shut. Claudor was instantly creepy as soon as I saw him on screen. It was a little different from the anime because in the anime, Claudor just came off as an overprotective butler. I had my suspicions about him, but he never seemed threatening until he actually revealed himself to be the menacing pirate Captain Kuro. It was a different take on the character, but still a very good one. The actor Alexander Menidas did very well in making every Every formal movement feel creepy. Even something like closing the door felt ominous as it seemed like he was hiding something. Everyone said he gave off of vampire vibes and I wouldn't know too much about that since I don't watch a lot of things about vampires, but he was somewhat what I would imagine Dracula behaves like, especially when he killed Mary. He always seemed like he was in control and he always kept a cool head until his fight with Luffy at the end. And another thing I enjoyed from this take on the Sir Village story was Kuro being responsible for Kaya's sickness. In the end, anime, we knew Kaya was sick and frail so she had to rely on Claudor for everything, but it wasn't clear if this was a natural sickness or if it was planned. Having it be explicit in the live action made Kuro seem much more menacing because he had more control over the whole situation. The inconsistent power scaling was honestly one of the most frustrating aspects of the show. 
There were some power scaling issues with the anime as well, but they weren't as obvious as they were in the live action. And if I had to guess, it's probably because it's easier to accept wacky stuff from animation as opposed to real people. On the top of my head, I can only think of a couple of power scaling mishaps from the anime, such as Mihawk having the title World Greatest Swordsman, while there are other characters who have swords who may be potentially stronger than him. And Shanks losing an arm to a Sea King when he probably should have been strong enough to come out of that conflict unscathed. These inconsistencies regarding power scaling came from the fact that this series started in 1998, and it has been going on for longer than 20 years. The plans Oda has with characters and plot points has probably shifted a bit over all of those years, so minor inconsistencies were inevitable. This adaptation, however, cannot share the same excuse, since all inconsistencies happen within one season. We saw Luffy use his monster strength to rip out Captain Morgan's safe from the ground. Before this scene, I wasn't sure if they were going to keep Luffy's monster strength in the adaptation because it seemed as if they were going for a more realistic approach. However, as soon as I saw that scene, I was somewhat able to gauge how strong Luffy was. Being able to rip that safe out of the ground and having stretchy powers made him a real force to be reckoned with. However, in the battle scene just after that with the marines, it was like his monster strength just disappeared. He wasn't weak, but he was being overpowered by regular marines. And to me, this was a jarring inconsistency in strength. Luffy was getting pushed around by these guys and even got almost completely restrained by one or two of them. With the level of strength he demonstrated earlier, this should have been impossible. Now, I can understand why they would do this, if he wasn't struggling, then there would be no tension in this situation, and Zoro wouldn't have had any reason to turn back and help his new friend, but just because I understand it, doesn't mean I can accept it. When stuff like this happens, it breaks my immersion and pulls me out of the story. If power scaling remains this inconsistent, it will be so much more difficult for me to believe in any of the struggles the crew faces, and the tension will always feel artificial. This wasn't the only time this happened by the way. Another example that stood out like a sore thumb was Zoro's strength or lack thereof. When he was climbing out of the well, we'd seen many feats of Zoro's strength at this point, like lifting the heavy safe all on his own and pushing back Morgan's giant axe hand with his own brute strength. But in the well, he seemed powerless. It would have been a bit more believable for him to be struggling if the well looked like it was wet and slippery, because then the issue would have been that he just couldn't get a grip. Unfortunately, no such excuse was given. We were just forced to believe this was an actual challenge for him despite past strength feats. And so once again, Again, my immersion was broken. Something similar happened in the anime with Zoro needing to climb a hill covered in oil, but it was more comical than serious. Also, it wasn't a strength barrier, but rather one of a lack of friction. The power scaling didn't completely break my interest in the adaptation, but it was definitely very annoying to deal with. I was honestly very surprised by the dynamic Kobe and Helmepo shared in this adaptation. It was not something I ever gave much mind to in the anime because their friendship didn't develop as naturally as it did here. Kobe was shown to be a very naive person, but he clearly had a lot of potential to be a great marine, not just because he was smart and he had a lot of transferable skills from his time as Alvita's slave, but because he was a very genuine guy who wanted to do his best to help people. His moral righteousness was so great that he even questioned if the marines were really the good guys at multiple moments moments in the show. Some of his moral purity rubbed off on Helmeppo over time, so he too gained some potential to be a great marine. Conversely, some of Helmeppo's wisdom and knowledge of the world rubbed off on Kobe, so he became more aware of what his place could be in the world. It was kind of beautiful, because Kobe helped Helmeppo get rid of some of his laziness and superiority complex, while Helmeppo helped Kobe get rid of his naivete. They both made each other better marines by the end of the show, in a much more superior way than the anime did. Granted, there was much more focus on the marines in the live action than in the anime, so that's probably why their relationship in the anime wasn't as fleshed out. From what I remember, both Kobe and Elmepo weren't official marines when they started in the anime. They were both chore boys with the opportunity to rank up if they were able to remain loyal to the marines and prove their worth. Helmepo was a bit of a spoiled brat, and so he dreamed of regaining a life of luxury back. Since the marine admirals had the lifestyle he desired, he wanted to rank up and obtain that goal. 
Kobe, similar to the live action, wanted to defend the innocent and he could do that better by increasing his rank through the Marines. Although their motives were very different, they had similar end goals, so they were able to push themselves to be better Marines. While this was definitely cool and it worked well in the anime, it didn't really have the same emotional appeal like the live action adaptations did. We spent so much more time with these characters in the live action so their development into friends felt so much more natural. One of my favorite scenes was when they were both drinking together on the Baratier. How Melpo offered to buy Kobe a drink, which was a very unusual level of kindness coming from his character. Then Kobe trusted him with the huge revelation that Luffy was Garp's grandson. Sharing this secret and these acts of kindness allowed them to come closer together despite their many disagreements in the past. Another moment I personally liked was when Helmeppo begrudgingly asked Kobe how he was doing before he explained the entire warlord system. I know I'm going to regret this, but what's wrong? Nothing. It demonstrated how Kobe's moral purity was starting to infiltrate Amepo's heart, while also giving Kobe some wisdom on how the world actually worked. It was the perfect way to convey how much they improve each other. The only thing I would have liked to have seen more of from Helmeppo was an exploration into what his dream was. We got that in the anime, but we didn't get it in the live action, which was kind of disappointing since One Piece was all about following your dreams. I can only guess that in the live action, instead of aiming to be an admiral, he shared Kobe's dream of being being a marine people can put their faith in. It's not bad to have an implicit dream, but I personally wanted a bit more. Other than that, their dynamic impressed me since it was so natural. The One Piece live action had the second largest budget for any show on Netflix to date, as it costed 18 million per episode. Seeing how it had eight episodes, that means they spent at least 144 million on this show. It made sense that such an enormous budget was required as the world of One Piece was very wacky, as there's a lot of weird powers, exotic places, and unusual creatures. It would take a lot of money to really bring this world to life and make it believable. So a high budget was definitely necessary. However, despite having a larger per episode budget than Game of Thrones, it was very obvious that the production ran into many walls due to budgetary restraints. The biggest example of this was how little Luffy used the gum gum fruit. In the anime, Luffy used his stretchy powers all the time, especially when he was in a fight. But in the live action, Luffy barely used his abilities during the fight with all the marines in the courtyard battle scene. Being able to stretch made it so much easier for Luffy to deal with multiple enemies at one time in the anime. He could use a gum gum whip to take down multiple enemies with one kick, or even a gum gum gatling to safely attack multiple enemies from an unreachable distance. Do you remember when Luffy first used Gum Gum Gatling in the anime? I wouldn't expect you to because it was a particularly unmemorable moment. It was when Luffy was fighting some random black hat pirates in Syrup Village. It was just a natural use of his abilities, so it didn't need to be a big moment. However, the first time Luffy used this technique in the live action was against Arlong, the final big bad of the season, excluding Garp. His powers were used sparingly and only for big moments because of how limited the production was by the budget. I actually somewhat saw this coming because this was the case for some live action superhero films as well. Let's take Spider-Man for example since everyone knows who he is. While I haven't read too many Spider-Man comics, I've heard that he used his powers more casually as Peter Parker. In the Insomniac Spider-Man video games, we saw both Peter Parker and Miles Morales drinking coffee while hanging upside down. In the movies Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse and Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, we see multiple scenarios of the Spider-Mans having conversations while walking on the side of buildings or while being completely upside down. They use their powers without purpose or meaning just because they can. It's like a natural extension of themselves. So it's no different than logging and talking at the same time is for us normal folk. This wasn't something that happened too often in live action Spider-Man movies, probably because of budgetary restraint. Displaying a character constantly doing unnatural stuff without reason will just drive up the cost of the effects, so they understandably try to save usage of powers for the most epic moments. I won't say that they never show casual use in the live action movies, as I'm sure you can find some instances, just like you can in the One Piece live action. But those moments were not nearly as prevalent as they were in the comics, video games, and animations. While these changes were predictable and understandable, they definitely removed a bit of charm 
Luffy had in the anime. The last big noticeable budgetary restraint was the sets. One Piece was about adventure and obtaining freedom to explore the world, but in the live action it felt as times as if we were restricted to a few locations. While the sets were beautiful, remaining in one location too long somewhat killed the sense of adventure the anime gave. Like Kaya's mansion was magnificent, but it sucked that we didn't get to see much of Sir Village. Other than the mansion, the only thing we saw was the shipyard in the one alley where Usopp cried pirates. I don't remember all the locations we visited in the anime, but it was definitely more than three. One memory that vividly comes to mind was that Luffy and the Straw Hats ate at a restaurant in the village. It's such a small detail, but having the characters interact with the environment around them made everything feel so much more real. In Orange Town, we only saw Buggy's tent, a small pathway outside, and the seashore. We missed out on the Shushu story with his pet food shop, and we didn't get to witness the horrifying destructive power of the buggy ball. I was completely fine with the Baratier set because there was literally nothing else around to be missing out on as it was just a ship in the middle of the sea. The set design for it was honestly my favorite of all of them in the show because it felt like a real classy restaurant that I would actually go to. While I do have my complaints about the obvious budgetary restraints, it honestly wasn't the worst. The Full Metal Alchemist live action completely completely wrote Alphonse out of some important scenes because they couldn't afford to animate him. It never got to that level in this adaptation, but it was prevalent enough that it broke my immersion from this series multiple times. It has me a bit worried for season 2 since what comes next is very adventure heavy with a lot more exotic locations and a specific person who might need to be completely animated with CGI. I heard that there will be an increased budget for the next season, but I am still very worried. I'll keep my fingers crossed that they will figure it out even better than they did this season. You already know how much I loved the Baratier set, but that wasn't the only magnificent detail this two episode arc had to offer. In the anime, the Baratier arc was the one which got me completely invested in the One Piece series. I'm not saying that everything before was bad as it was interesting enough to keep me watching after all, but this arc was a huge turning point in the series. We got to see firsthand what it meant to put everything on the line for a shot at accomplishing a dream, while also getting a taste of how dangerous the threats on the Grand Line would be. While Drake Gil Mihawk did not come off as mysterious as he did in the anime, he still represented the challenges of the Grand Line really well, maybe even better than the anime did. The scene of Mihawk slaughtering a giant pirate crew single-handedly was very cool, but also very terrifying. Seeing how he moved on screen let us know how powerful he was and that we needed to take him seriously. Not to mention, seeing him do stuff like slice a ship in half with an air slash technique was definitely foreshadowing the level of combat that other Straw Hats will need to be at in the future. Watching Zoro being willing to go so far to accomplish his dream made me realize how much these characters valued their ambitions. Anyone who traveled on the Mary, even Usopp, the most cowardly man amongst them, would be willing to risk everything for their dream. The importance of dreams was a huge theme for this series, and this moment was where it was highlighted the most for the entire East Blue saga. I will, however, say that the anime version of it was more enjoyable with the action and Zoro's declaration to never lose again, but the live action version was still pretty hard to watch. Nami's betrayal was also handled a bit differently in this version of One Piece. In the anime, Nami stole the Going Merry while everyone was distracted and took off. There was a lot of confusion as to why she would do this, and the only thing we had to go off of was how intensely she was looking at a bounty poster of Arlong. It somewhat felt like she was actually playing the long con and now she was moving on. In the live action adaptation, it was very obvious Nami cared about everyone in the crew. She wanted to stop Zoro from engaging in a potentially deadly battle against Mihawk, and she tried to warn Luffy about Arlong. It seemed as if she only betrayed the crew because it was the only way to keep them safe from Arlong. If she didn't reveal herself when she did, Luffy may have actually gotten his head bitten off. In the anime, I didn't know for sure if Nami actually cared about any of the Straw Hats until we saw she faked Usopp's death in order to keep him safe from Arlong. I'm not saying one was definitely better than the other, but just that they both invoked different feelings about Nami's status. The Baratier was also where we got introduced to the chef of the Straw Hats. Sanji. We got to see his 
creativity with food and his passion for cooking, his flirty personality was also showcased and it was honestly not as annoying as it was in the anime. It was a bit more subtle, but we'll see how it evolves in the future. His interactions with Zeph were amazing as well. Their chemistry together on stream was something I wasn't expecting. Zeph treated Sanji harshly at times, but it was also obvious that he cared about him and vice versa. Their flashback was my favorite one at this point in the series when I watched it in the anime, and the live action definitely did it justice. I was pleasantly surprised to see that they went with the Zeph eating his own leg thing from the manga since in the anime, they changed it to him losing it while saving Sanji in the sea. I always loved the leg eating version more since it demonstrated how much he was willing to sacrifice for Sanji. Not only did he give him all the rations of food, he also sacrificed his reputation as the fearsome pirate Red Leg Zeph, all because he wanted to pass on his dream to the next generation. So even if he died or was unable to go on adventures, his dream would still live on. It tied back to how important one's dream was to a person and how much they would be willing to sacrifice for it. Sanji's farewell scene was very emotional as he was saying goodbye to the man who took him in out of the kindness of his heart. I found the anime scene a bit better since it felt more dramatic, but it was still handled very well here. The largest change from the original material was the removal of the Krieg pirate conflict at Baratier. While it was reasonable to expect some changes as not everything can translate well into live action, this change unfortunately undermined Sanji's character. Similar to Usopp, I found myself asking, what reason did Sanji have for joining the Straw Hat crew? The obvious answer would be to chase after his dream of finding the All Blue, but he had no reason to trust that this was the crew that could get him there. The only events Sanji knew about was Zoro almost being killed by Mihawk and Luffy challenging Arlong while barely surviving the encounter. There was no reason to put his faith in these people in the live action, so his motivation for joining the crew was a bit questionable. In the anime, Luffy proved that he wasn't just an overconfident pirate who didn't know what he was doing. He defeated the strongest human pirate in the East Blue. Zeph and all the other chefs knew from watching Luffy overcome such a great obstacle that this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. Luffy clearly had the potential to become a great pirate and he could blaze a path towards finding the All Blue. Not to mention, in the anime version, everyone was watching the Zoro vs Mihawk fight. They saw him risk his life for his dream and gain the acknowledgement of a powerful warlord. This action demonstrated this crew took their dreams seriously and it conveyed their potential to reach those dreams. The main reason Sanji left in the live action was because of the conversation he had with Zeph after Arlong's crew came through. It was a decent in conversation, but the ending of it was very impulsive, like he decided to join the Straw Hats on a whim. I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically said, since you clearly don't appreciate me here, maybe I'll be appreciated on the Going Merry. But in the anime, it was clear no amount of underappreciation was going to make Sanji leave. He only left because he realized Zef and the other cooks wanted him to pursue his dreams, and they would go to ridiculous lengths to help him do so. They attempted to convey this sentiment in the live action when Zef said, It's one thing to have a dream, it's another to go after it. But it wasn't delivered as well as it was in the anime, probably because, like I mentioned earlier, there was no reason to believe Luffy was capable enough to help Sanji accomplish his dream. Removing the Don Creek plot also severely diminished the idea behind Sanji giving Jin food for free despite him being a pirate. Giving Jin food was what directly led to an attack on the Baratier since he was replenished enough to bring his entire crew back to raid the restaurant. However, despite that fact, Sanji never regretted what he did because he could understand his pain. Even though he might make things more difficult for other people at times with his actions and decisions, he will never abandon his moral code. In this case, his moral code forbade him from not serving food to a starving man. And in other cases, his moral code prevents him from doing other stuff that may make things more inconvenient for people around him. Not having this cause and effect scenario removes important parts of Sanji's character from his introduction. Overall, not having Don Krieg at Baratie was pretty bad for Sanji as it weakened his character and lessened the impact of him joining the crew. When the trailer came out, there were so many people who thought Arlong's design was trash. 
myself included. He did not look as menacing as he did in the anime, and the shawl shark nose looked silly rather than threatening. Not to mention his size was pretty average compared to the anime. However, despite all of that, Arlong still came off pretty menacing, and that was in most part thanks to the setup for his character and the acting done by McKinley Belcher III. The way he was set up made him seem like more of a gangster as opposed to being a pirate. He claimed the East Blue as his turf, and if any pirates wanted to operate on his turf, then they'd have to pay tribute to him. He came after Buggy because he felt like he was disrespecting him as a pirate. He probably also owed Arlong some money too, but he shifted to a new target when he heard of Luffy's existence. A new pirate who hadn't pledged his loyalty to Arlong was roaming the East Blue carefree, and Arlong couldn't let that slide. The desire of the writers to set him up earlier did wonders for his threat level, but it also did harm the story a bit as well. I already talked about this a bit in the last section, but the Don Creek storyline being cut ruined a lot of Sanji's character development. Don Krieg was essentially replaced with Arlong since he was the threat who arrived at the Baratier, so even though it increased Arlong's threat level, it harmed the story overall. But that aside, another thing that made me take him seriously was the fact that he was the only antagonist at this point in the series who actually defeated Luffy. In the anime, this moment wouldn't come until much later against a stronger adversary, but having this happen now forced us to take him seriously. I don't know if it will diminish the impact of that future moment moment though, so I guess we'll find out in season 2. But overall, Arlong definitely came off as an absolute menace in the live action. Having his presence at locations other than Arlong Park made it feel as if he was actually conquering the East Blue. With his deep and harsh voice, you could clearly hear his hatred and disgust for humans. I won't say he was better than the anime because I still prefer the anime version of Arlong, but the live action version was still scary in his own way, and was definitely worthy enough to be considered the final major antagonist of the saga or season. One of the most common complaints I've heard about the One Piece live action was the marine plot. Aside from the Baratie change, this was the biggest change to the story of One Piece as the anime solely focused on Luffy and his crew's journey through the East Blue. After he parted ways with Kobe, we didn't see much from him until way down the line. The only bit of marine story we got in the East Blue saga was just a two episode focus on Kobe and Helmeppo being trained by Garp, but they didn't ever cross paths with the main characters. In the live action, they were constantly pursuing the straw hats and therefore they had increased relevance to the main plot. I didn't think the marine storyline was as bad as a lot of people made it out to be, but it did have its fair share of ups and downs. Garp was a very interesting personality and a joy to have on screen, but towards the end, many of his actions started not to make much sense. He would throw temper tantrums like a child whenever Luffy successfully escaped his grasp, but apparently he was never serious about his pursuit of Luffy in the first place. It made a lot of sense that he was taking it easy on his grandson because if you watch the anime, and especially if you've read the manga, you know that Garp was so much stronger than he was portrayed in his action scenes. If he seriously wanted to capture Luffy as he was leaving Surf Village, he probably could have jumped from his ship to theirs and caught them easily, or at the very least thrown more than one cannonball. However, if this was all some game to him, the tantrums don't make much sense since he wouldn't have any reason to be angry. I guess the maniacal laughter could be viewed as having pride in his grandson, but that can't explain the property damage. Maybe he's just crazy and I'm overthinking this. An interpretation I liked a bit more was that Garp actually did want to capture Luffy at first, but after his conversation with Kobe, he decided to let Luffy chase after his dream. It could have been that moment where he understood Luffy will always be a pirate, whether he was free on his own adventure or if he was imprisoned and executed like Roger was. Since Garb wouldn't want his grandson to be locked up, he realized he had to let him pursue his own dream. The only downside to this explanation would be the power scaling one. If Garp really was going all out at the beginning, then he should have easily caught Luffy. Garp's character ended up being a bit of a confusing mess when you look back on him, which sucked because he could have been so much cooler. I still have mixed feelings about the whole grandpa reveal as well, because in the anime, it happened way down the line in an arc called Post Any's Lobby. By the time Garp reunited with Luffy, he had already made a name for himself as a notorious pirate, and it was Garp's first time seeing Luffy since he had become one. There was no chance Garp 
could talk Luffy out of this path now since he had already done some pretty heavy stuff. His visit was friendly in nature as it was a request from Kobe and Helmeppo to reunite with Luffy and meet his crew. After they chatted for a bit, the Marines left and they parted ways without any issues. However, the fleet admiral of the Marines forced Garp to go back and at least attempt to capture the Straw Hat Pirates. I guess him not wanting to arrest his grandson wasn't a good enough excuse for him to not do anything. Garp started throwing cannonballs with his bare hands at Luffy's ship as he attempted to escape from the island, but he got away in spectacular fashion. I apologize for the long summary, but I did it to point out a lot of the information we got from their reunion in the anime was already revealed in the live action. Everyone knows Garp is Luffy's grandfather, and everyone knows Kobe and Helmeppo are both working under him and training under him. They even had the great escape scene with Garp throwing cannonballs and the Straw Hats escaping by ship. If they get to post any's lobby in the live action, Action? Will we just go through all of this again? There would be little to no reason for them to meet up during this time since Garp already got a chance to reunite with his grandson after he became a pirate. The main reason I had mixed feelings about this reveal was because it might lessen the impact of future storylines if the One Piece live action ever gets that far. Do you remember in the fourth section of this video where I was talking about Captain Axehan Morgan and I said there was a genius solution to Patch's character but it would be more relevant to a later section? I wouldn't blame you if you forgot as I barely remembered myself. In that section, I was talking about how Morgan wasn't super corrupt and that he didn't do anything bad enough to deserve the punishment he got. The solution I heard of may have had the potential to fix both that problem and the Garp problem we've had in this section as well. Instead of having Garp being the one to chase after Luffy, maybe it should have been Morgan. I don't remember where I heard the solution from, I think it was from the YouTuber Grand Line Review, but it could have also been from the r slash One Piece subreddit. Anyways, the idea would be Morgan was embarrassed by his failure at having the map to the Grand Line stolen and being defeated by three rookie pirates. In order to reclaim his honor, he would attempt to hunt Luffy down with a handful of his subordinates, including Kobe and Helmeppo. Maybe his pursuit would have shown a darker, more corrupt side of him, which could actually warrant a harsh punishment. And it could have been the case that Helmeppo lost faith in his father after discovering Kuro was actually alive and his father was a fraud. Then at the end, Garb could have come in to punish Morgan and take Kobe and Omepo under his wing. The point was, replacing Garb with Morgan would have solved Morgan's lack of corruption issues while also completely removing the Garp issues. It was obviously very important for the crew dynamic to be done very well since part of what made the anime fun was how these interesting personalities came together to form a family. We started with a fun trio of a pirate, a bounty hunter, and a thief. They had a whole unwilling allies thing going on since they had to work together to achieve their objectives and escape from the marines. Well, it was mostly unwilling for Zoro and Nami since Luffy immediately considered them members of his crew. It was adorable to see them slowly growing attached to Luffy over time even though they wouldn't admit it. Both Zoro and Nami were the only members of their group who acted like reasonable adults as opposed to Luffy acting like an optimistic child. A scene I remember vividly was Luffy being appalled by the idea of stealing a ship, and he believed something would come up that would allow him to get a ship the right way for free. After he gave his spiel, Zoro looked at Nami and asked her what the real plan was. Zoro and Nami were on the same page so often that there were times I low-key shipped them. I've never shipped them in the anime, but it felt as if they had a connection in this series. I'm aware of Oda's no romance within the crew rule, but the scene they shared on Baratier, where they were attempting to learn more about each other, felt very romantic. Unfortunately, the next member to join the crew, Usopp, didn't have as many bonding moments with the other Straw Hats. The only one he had was with Luffy and Zoro in Kaya's mansion at night. Luffy had gone out looking for food, and Zoro had gone out looking for booze. I can't quite remember why Usopp was there, but he was there. I love this scene so much because it was a boys bonding moment while Nami and Kaya were having a girls bonding moment. Usopp learned about Luffy's connection to his father while Luffy and Zoro learned a bit about Usopp's potential feelings for Kaya. It was just a feel good slice of life crew bonding moment and it was a shame that Usopp didn't get much of these in the live action series. Sanji quickly fit in with the rest of the group by coming out with his flirty quirk. After he did the whole simping for Nami scene, all of the boys were roasting him and Nami for 
how obviously into her he was. It made me laugh and it made me feel as if he already fit within the crew. Then his rivalry with Zoro came very quickly after, which was a bit surprising since it didn't start until later in the anime. However, adding this rivalry here added another layer to the crew's dynamic and it was very entertaining to watch. Overall, the acting from the Straw Hat crew was phenomenal since I believed in their friendship. There were also lots of YouTube videos floating around with the Straw Hat cast answering questions and doing fun challenges together. Their friendship felt so real on screen because they learned to be great friends with each other in real life as well. This show may not have been perfect, but I will stand by my claim that it was a perfect adaptation. It was the best live action adaptation of any anime I have ever seen, and it definitely broke the live action curse. It was so entertaining, it received praise from both the fans of the original and people who have never even touched the anime. It was number one trending on Netflix in 86 different countries around the world, and it did so well that it's been greenlit for a second season. While I am not entirely sure what metrics are used to determine the success of TV shows on Netflix, I heard it was some combination of watch hours and new subscriptions. Since the One Piece live action was definitely a success, it must have had a huge audience who watched all the way through and who are excited to watch the second season. I know this review was extremely long and I am so sorry about that. I normally don't do videos like this on my channel, but I was very inspired by this adaptation that I felt like I had to talk about it. Maybe I should have broken this into two separate videos so I could have gotten this out sooner when it was more relevant. The crazy thing is that even though this is my longest review, I still didn't mention everything I enjoyed about the series, like how cool the bounty introductions were. I didn't even talk about stuff like Logetown being cut either, so I guess this review isn't a complete analysis of my thoughts on the show. That being said, I touched on most things that stood out to me and I'm very happy with how this review turned out. I am curious to see what they will do about the second season. The East Blue was mostly a tutorial to One Piece as characters, locations, and plots become way more eccentric. It's going to be more difficult to bring to life than this season, and it may not even be possible. In this season, we only saw two different Devil Fruit abilities, the Gum Gum Fruit and the Chop Chop Fruit. When I think about all of the arcs Season 2 will probably cover, there will be at least 17 new Devil Fruit abilities if my memory serves me correctly. I've talked about this a bit already, but in order for the series to maintain this level of quality, they will definitely need an increased budget for the next season so they can do the story justice. Only time will tell how the production will deal with these issues, but as of right now, they've earned my trust, so I will have faith in their talents.